was a kindergarten teacher, and she was observing her classroom of children while they were drawing pictures. And she would occasionally walk around to see each child's artwork, and she came to one little girl who was working diligently, and she asked what the drawing was. And the girl replied, I'm drawing God. The teacher paused and said, but no one knows what God looks like. Without missing a beat or looking up from her drawing, the girl replied, they will in a minute. Okay. <laughs> How do we describe God? There is the world that we live in right there. The whole point of that video is that you see a cross-section of the world we live in. We have to be so careful of the faith walk that we have and the, and the company that we keep and the environment that we live in that we lose sight of the world that we are a part of. We're not of the world, but we are in the world. And that's the world. Some won't, won't, don't want to be bothered. Some see him as a punishing God. Some see, can't describe God. Some say there's no God. That's the arrogance at its highest. How do we express to others what God is? Because that's really ultimately what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be expressing to others what God is all about, who he is, defining him, drawing, trying to create some sort of mental picture, let alone a picture of him. So many different ways, as the video emphasized for us, God can be defined. It's interesting how some define him as loving and caring, and others, again, judgmental. I happened upon a story of Reverend Graham, Billy Graham, while at a Youth of Christ rally. He was approached by a curious college student who posed this provocative question to him. He asked, what kind of guy is God? What kind of guy is he? What would you say? What kind of guy is God? You may not have realized it at the time, but that's quite the mountain of a question. And I think many of us would, would trip down that mountain. I think many of us would struggle with the answer to that question. How would you define God? How would any of us answer that question? I think it's important that we take a look at that. How do we express what we believe, what, whom we have a relationship with, supposedly? If someone asked you to tell them about your God, what would you say? What would you say? And while you're mulling that one over, let me take you back in time. Nearly two millennia to the ancient city of Athens. In our Brich HaDashah portion from Acts 17, as the Talmud Rabbi Shaul approached the great city of Athens, he came not as a sightseer, but as a soul winner. He arrived with open eyes, and he arrived with a broken heart for the people there. Do you have a broken heart for the people that are in your oikos, in your circle of influence? People you might work with, people who are your neighbors, people that are your family, et cetera, et cetera. That's your circle of influence. Do you have a heart for them? Do you care about them? We talked about that last Shabbat. Modeani, are you thankful for those people in your life? Are you thankful for the fact that some are believers and some are not? Because some of those that are not believers, some of those that are very secular in their viewpoint, are tremendous blessings for us. Because they challenge us in our own convictions. They challenge us to be able to define and understand the God that we claim to follow and believe in. Paul had a heart for the people. He loved the people in his life. And Athens at this time was in a period of decline, not unlike our own nation right now. We are in a period of decline. When history looks back at this country, as much as you want to rah-rah politically, we are in a moral decline. We are declining exponentially. And that was the case in Athens at the time. They were in a period of decline in the early first century. And those still recognized, not unlike us, in the center of culture and education, the glory of its politics and commerce had long since faded. It had a famous university, numerous 
beautiful buildings, but it wasn't the influential city that it once had been. The city was given over to cultural paganism that was nourished by idolatry, novelty, and philosophy. The Greek myths spoke of gods and goddesses that in their own rivalries and ambitions acted more like petty humans than gods. And goodness, when you went back in that time, there were plenty of deities to choose from. You can have your own god. There are plenty. Someone once said that in Athens it was easier to find a god than a person. There was even an altar dedicated to the unknown god. Didn't want to leave anybody out there. Sort of like our memorial to the unknown soldier, just in case they had missed one. They don't want to miss any gods. Rabbi Shaul saw the city was, and he said this in scripture, wholly given to idolatry, to the worship of false, non-existence gods, and it broke his heart. We are no different today. And if you want any proof or evidence of that, take a look at the news last night at, during Black Friday. You don't think materialism is God? <laughs> so, as always, Shaul spoke in the synagogue with Jews and he witnessed in the marketplace to the Greeks. And it didn't take long for the local philosophers to catch wind of Paul's preaching, so it was only natural for the council of the Aeropagus, or Pagus, which was responsible for watching over both religion and education in the city to investigate this foreign god that Paul was teaching about. We didn't know about this guy. He threw us a curveball. There's another god. And they courteously invited Paul to present his teaching at an informal meeting of the council on Mars Hill. And after all, the Bible says that, and I quote from Acts 17, 21, all the Athenians and the foreigners living there used to spend their spare time talking or hearing about the latest intellectual facts. And taking the center stage in the Areopagus, Shaul stood up, the scripture says, in the council meeting, and he said, men of Athens, I see how very religious you are in every way. For as I was walking around looking at your shrines, I even found an altar which had been inscribed to an unknown God. So the one whom you are already worshiping in ignorance, this is the one I proclaim to you. What an introduction. Shaul connects, of course, immediately with the audience. He's got their undivided attention. Wouldn't he get your attention if he called you ignorant? in a very politically or socially correct way. He says, see this God that you worship without even knowing his name, well, that's the God I'm going to tell you about. What? And he's not just a God. He is the God. The God. And then Rabbi Shul proceeds to answer the question that would be, Posed to Billy Graham 20 centuries later is what kind of guy is this guy? In eight insight infested verses, Rabbi Shaul unfolds three foundational truths, three attributes of God that help us understand his character and his nature. Well, what kind of guy is God? Well, first of all, he's creative, <laughs> right? He's creative. Paul begins in his introduction about this unknown God by saying, the God who made the universe and everything in it. The God who made all that you see. Everything that you are looking at, God made. He's a creator God. Now every thoughtful person wonders at some point in their life, where do I come from? Why am I here? Right? Why am I so handsome? It's a burden I have to carry. <laughs> Why am I so beautiful? Why did God pick me? Where am I going? Probably a question a lot of people ask of you. Where are you going? 
<laughs> what are you doing? Science attempts to answer the first question, and philosophy wrestles with the second question. But only the unknown God offers a satisfactory answer to all three. Paul's audience that day was well, consisted of primarily two schools of thought that existed at that time. There was the Stoics, or the, uh, the Epicurean philosophers, and the Stoic philosophers. Now, what's the difference, you might ask? Well, I'm going to tell you. The Epicureans believed in a deity that was distant from humanity. That sort of attitude is still reflected in many of our mainline denominations that God is so holy that he could never have fellowship with us or we would compromise him in some way. And so he has to remain ethereal, distant from us and not be in immediate relationship with us. That's the Epicurean philosophical point of view. Now there, these Epicureans were also materialists at heart. We thought that the universe and everything in it was eternal. It just always had been there. The Stoics, however, were a little pantheistic. That is, they believed that the universe and everything in it was God. Creation is God. And that the universe itself is sort of this being. But God, well, I should say Rabbi Shul Bully affirmed that Moshe penned long ago in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God made the world and everything in it. He is not a distant God divorced from his creation, nor is he an imprisoned God locked inside creation. He is a creative God, the creator of heaven and earth. The universe and everything in it was custom tailored by a creative God, a God who expresses his imagination and artistry all throughout our swirling galaxy. Have you ever seen any greater beauty than looking into the universe and seeing some of those pictures like from the Hubble telescope and stuff? God created that. You know, it's amazing to me, just a mild rant, but it's amazing to me that we can marvel, I believe Vic and his children spent yesterday at the Museum of Art in Cleveland. And we can marvel at some of the amazing artistic renderings that have been created by men hours upon hours upon hours to create these pieces. And we appreciate their work and their creativity, don't we? But what is it about God's creation that just happens by accident? The, most, the greatest beauty we've ever experienced in the world is heavenly, and we think it's an accident. Isn't it amazing to you to think that way? How, what an absurd thinking that can be. And I'm going to unpack that a little bit later. God handcrafted all that you, that you see, and he was telling that to those who were in attendance, including actually me and you. King David once praised God, saying, I thank you because... I am awesomely made. It wasn't on an ego trip. He just appreciated, you know, God's hand in creating human beings. Wonderfully. Your works are wonders. I know this very well. And that was written 3,000 years ago. He got it. Today, with all the scientific knowledge and the technology of the ages at our fingertips, we should be no less impressed by the intricate workings of God's greatest Masterpiece. One of the most amazing examples of artistry and design in the human body is what? What part of the human body? Uh, what part of the human body dazzles us the most? What's the most impressive part of our bodies? Eyes. Isn't it amazing? And those of us who've had struggles with our eyes, as I have had. I've learned more about eyes. I got the eye chart memorized. I've had too many eye exams. T Z V E C L. That's 2020 right there. So there's your proof. <laughs> your eyes are wonderfully complex organs, and they receive 
and focus light patterns. They convert them into nerve impulses and send them to the brain so you can see where you are going. So when somebody asks you, you at least got some evidence that, yeah, I, I think I'm going that way. In some ways, the eye is similar to like a camera or a video camera. Video camera has a protective lens cover. We have the eyelids, right? Every time I set up our camera, I open up the, eye, the, the, the lens cover. Camera has a lens that's capable of automatically focusing at various distances, so does your eye. Unless you've had lens replacement and cataract. A camera senses the amount of light it is receiving and adjusts its aperture to ensure that the picture is neither over nor underexposed. The eye also senses these variations and adjusts the opening in front of the eye, the pupil, accordingly. Why well, one eye can't do that anymore? because I have a softball in the face. But, you know, that's why I say, so many people have looked at me and say, what's going on with your eye, dude? <laughs> and my BC days, they go, well, I'm just stoning half my body, okay? Just a joke, just a joke for those other people. Your pupils are like wide open, frozen open. But, I, you know, that's, it's so like when it's really sunny out, you know, or, or like especially in the winter, when the snow, like it's a bright day and the snow's out there, it's like lasers. It's just like laser, man. It, it's tough. It's tough. It's really tough. The retina, of course, is the back of the eye, and it's covered with a layer of tall, tightly packed cells. And these cells are two types of rods and cones. Linda is following my every statement about the eye. I'm sure I'm going to pass my anatomy physiology class here. <laughs> See if he messes this up. <laughs> And each eye contains about 100 million rod cells that are extremely sensitive to dim light and see in black and white, and about 3 million cone cells that are responsible for seeing color. And as light is focused upon these rods and cones, it is absorbed and converted into electrical signals, similarly to the way a camera converts light into digital code. The signals are processed by a network of interneurons that enhances the information before it is sent to our brain. Of course, all this is done, how fast? Fractions of a second. And it's easy. It's easy to be amazed by the bells and whistles of a complicated piece of equipment like a cell phone, video camera. It's amazing, really, if you think about it. Most of us have no idea. Does anybody have really any idea how this really works? <laughs> But you've grown to be very dependent upon these, haven't you? Right? But we know what? When, I, when we look at our cell phones, it took a pretty, pretty imaginative inventor to create it, right? Somebody sat down and thought about this. And somebody, with the help of others, created it, right? Now, in comparison to complexity, the human eye makes the camera look like a child's toy. How much more amazed should we be? than at the marvelous workmanship of a created God. Yet Christians, Messianic Jews, are comfortable with the, emo the notion that our eyes just happened by accident and evolved over time. Yes, believers believe that. Because you feel it's not, you don't have intellectual integrity if you actually believe in the creation account. How narrow-minded. Somehow you try to sort of uh, syncretize the creation of a biblical creation account together with science and try to sort of make it all work. Sorry, pal. It doesn't. It's either one or the other. It's one or the other. Imagine, imagine the reaction people would have if you tried to convince them your cell phone. So many of you use now to take pictures, record videos. Oh, I don't know, man. It was like an accident, dude. It's just like, like this guy walked into a room and he just threw a bunch of parts together, and and there it was. It was just it showed up a cell phone. Would you believe that? Would that seem seem absurd to think that way? Well, the eye is by far more complex complex than this piece of you know junk. And, probably going to replace it in about a year because something better has come out. And we have no problem thinking that way about our human body, our eyes, or creation. 
Oh, it was an accident. This kind of happened. Things kind of came together. Yeah. Think about the logic of what you're thinking. You would never think that way about something that's made by human hands. But you, but you look at creation and you think, oh, of course that's the way it happened. It was an accident. Just things kind of happen. Now, the kind of guy is God? Well, obviously, I think I've made my point. He's creative. But he's also caring. And several people in the video brought up that point. It's caring, it's loving. See, after introducing the unknown God to the Athenians, Paul continues to tell them about him. Paul goes on to say, this God is the one who gives life. He gives breath and everything else to people. He does not need any help from them. He has everything he needs. He's God. In other words, God didn't just set the world in motion and then leave us to fend for ourselves. He cares for you. And he continues to be involved in the affairs of human life. He provides for our needs. And he himself has no needs. He lacks nothing and he gives everything. God is not dependent on man's offerings for his being because God is a much greater giver. It is God who gives to us exactly what we do need. Paul says that life itself is a gift from above and needed and every breath we breathe is courtesy of God. And on top of that, every gift that is given and needed by the human race comes from a caring God. Everything we need and receive is a divine gift. This holiday season, those are the gifts that you need to be thinking about. The gifts that God has given you. The Bible says every good act of giving... <laughs> And every perfect gift is where? It's from above. Coming down from the Father who made the heavenly light, with him there is neither variation nor darkness caused by turning. See, the time you have on earth is a gift from God. It doesn't owe you anything. It gave you a gift. It gave you a gift of life. And what can you give in return to him? You can give back your life. Because that's... If, what could you get? Of, what, what can we give God? <laughs> what do we give God that He needs? Yes. Nothing. So what do we give Him that we have greatest value of? What we value more than anything else is us, our life. So if you want to give something, if you want to show your gratitude towards God, if you want to show your love for God, if you want to give Him the most amazing gift this holiday season, why don't you give your life to God? Give it back to Him. Give it to Him. That would be an amazing gift. Was he on your gift list this year? Did you have him to your gift list? Kids, mom, dad, family, friends. Was God there? What gift were you giving him? I thought you were in covenant. I thought you were in a relationship. The energy or mobility we have that enables us to get up and go. To go to work in the morning or come to celebrate your body. That's, that's a gift from God. The talents and skills which we earn and income with are gifts from God. The combination of all these are productivity accomplishments. They're all gifts from God. Our purpose in life, gift from God. What would life be without a purpose? None of us came into this world when we chose, and because we chose, but because God had a purpose in mind for us. Our families, uh, parents, our grandparents, a good husband, wife, incredible children that many of us have shared this Thanksgiving weekend with are all God's gifts. Gifts as we shared last Shabbat that we should be thankful for. Thankful for others. The Bible says children are a gift from the Lord and they are a reward from Him. Houses we live in Covers to keep us warm in a cold night. Friends with whom we can share our joys and sorrows are all gifts from God. And when we count our blessings, we shouldn't neglect the spiritual ones. Eternal life, the greatest of all gifts, is from God. The Bible says God saved you by His grace when you believe. And you can't take credit for this. Why? Because it is a what? It's a what? It is a what? It's a gift from God. 
When God created the humankind, Adam and Chava, or Eve, he gave them Gar Eden, a beautiful place to live. It was paradise. And he came and he walked with them and he talked with them and he enjoyed their company. And then came the tragedy. The tragedy called sin. And humanity was alienated from God. That wonderful association was broken. Adam and Chava were driven from the garden and from the presence of God, who was the source of all life and death entered the world. But God, but God in his great love, would not allow things to end that way. No. He reached out to us. He reached out to us. He shouldn't have sat back and waited for you to clean up your mess. But God is gracious and love. He reached into your life. He took the lead to heal the relationship. He didn't have any pride. All he had was unconditional love. So he's the one who had standed the, set in the hand of friendship, of restoration, of redemption. He sent his only son, Yeshua, to die in the tree and to pay the penalty for that separation. And that's how much this God loves and cares for you and me. That's the unknown God. That unknown God is creative. That unknown God is caring. But finally, Rabbi Yeshua goes on to say that he is commanding. Yes. He has desires and he has a will. Continuing his brief biography of the unknown God, Paul announces, he created all the people of the world from one man, Adam, and scattered the nations across the face of the earth. He decided beforehand what should rise and what should fall and when. He determined their boundaries. In other words, God is a commanding God. He is a sovereign God in charge. Not my will, but thy be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not your will, not my will, but whose will? His be done. He is sovereign. The gods of the Greeks were distant beings. They had no concern for the problems and needs of humankind. But the God of creation is also the God of history and geography. He is Lord of heaven and earth. The first time I heard someone talking about this, Sovereignty of God, it didn't really quite click. So let me make sure we're all on the same page. Webster's defined sovereignty like this. As an adjective above or superior to all others. Chief, greatest, supreme. Supreme in power or rank or authority. A person who possesses sovereign authority or power. If someone is sovereign, can't go no higher. They're the boss. He calls the shots. He has the authority. What he says goes. He is the king. Johnny Manziel found that out from his coach, didn't he? Parked his little butt on the bench for lying to his coach. There was sovereign authority in the football team, sovereign authority in the congregation, sovereign authority in all creation. God claims to be king, not just of this planet, but of all creation. He is outside of time. He is infinite, not finite like we are. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is the ruler of everything. He doesn't have to explain himself to you. In other words, God is in control. I am. That's such a comfort. And it should be a comfort. It's a comfort to me. It should be a comfort to you. What a, how about when a close friend's in the ICU? It's a loved one. It's someone who means the world to you. You know where you find comfort? Knowing that God is in control. He knows. He knows. When the economy, national or personal, is on the slide, guess what? God's got it. He didn't miss it. He knows what's going on. When tyrants or terrorists rage out of control, guess what? God is in what? Control. He orchestrates and determines what he's going to do in your life, in my life, in the president's life, in countries, everywhere. He's in control. Nothing will ever enter your life that God does not decree or follow. Period. Now, I know Joe, Joe wrestled with that a little bit. He did. 
So God called him on it. That's what it means to be sovereign. Nothing will ever enter your life that if, if you are willing to trust him, he cannot work out for your good. He is a commanding God, and he loves you. When you bow your head to pray, I know all you do. When you're in a jam or you need to ask God for something, are you aware of who you are talking to? The one who, whom you pray has power over the entire universe of every single atom, and yet he is infinitely loving, and he cares about every person's petty little need here compared to the large scheme of creation. You know what? We would do well to take a look at our issues and our problems and our aches and pains and struggles. And God, I care. God cares. We had a lot of prayer for a lot of that today. But now take your life and put it out there in the grand scheme of creation. And then take the consideration that we serve a loving, infinite God who cares. It kind of lights alone, doesn't it? If you're doing all that you can do, that's enough. God's got it from there. He doesn't expect any more from you, any less. Do the best you can with what you got, and the rest is in his hands. And he promises you that it's going to work out. I remember Larry Bailey. Remember Larry? He always used to say the same thing. It'll work out. <laughs> it's going to work out. I, lo I, I loved his optimism. Because he understood the sovereignty of God. No matter what, it's going to work out. And he's right. He's right. God is in control. The one whom you pray has power over all creation. Over and that's who you are talking to. And, you know, I can only imagine the raised eyebrows Rabbi Shul must have received as he spoke these words. But one thing is for sure, the unknown God is far greater than the gods of Greek men. So, how do we respond to such a God? Well, if there is a sovereign king over all the universe, the first response would be to bow before him. How often do you get prostrate? Prostrate, prostrate. On that medical thing. Prostrate. How often do you get prostrate? How often do you get on your face before the Lord? How often? Some of you do, some of you don't. Remember, he's the sovereign king over all the universe. Paul challenged the Athenians, and since this is true, Paul says, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent, to shuvah their sins, and to turn to him. Do you remember the old movies? They're so good. When the king would come by and all the peasants would bow down, ooh, you all be on your face before the almighty whoever it was. Why did he do that? Because he was a king. Some respected him, others dared not to offend him. But we're not talking about a human king, we're talking about the sovereign Lord, the king of glory. The day will come, the day will come when every tongue will confess him and every knee will bow and submit. To so all those people, oh, there is no God. I'm not religious. I don't know. <laughs> You're going to know. <laughs> You're going to find out. Yep, you're going to find out. Yep, you are. Right? One day is coming where they're going to understand. We're not talking about a human king. We're talking about a sovereign Lord, the King of the Lord. For those who trust in Yeshua while alive on this planet, there will be a day of awesome celebration. The wisest, most intelligent move that you can make this holiday season, this moment in time, is to surrender all that you are and all that you have to the one who loves you like no one else can ever love you, who is in control. All that time and effort that you have spent shopping for that special thing, for 
for someone in your life. They didn't get you salvation. They don't take care of every aspect of your life like God does. Is there anything in your life that you have not surrendered to God? Does He hold the same place in your heart that He holds over heaven and earth that He will hold for all eternity? Can you sing with certainty, Lord, reign in me? Can you say that with certainty? So, in conclusion, I don't know how Billy Graham responded. I don't have that answer. But the question was this guy God like. But I think I know how Rabbi Shalom would have responded. What kind of guy is God? Paul would say he's creative. He made the world, everything in it. He made you. Pretty darn creative making him. He's a caring God who gives to all people life and breath and all things, and he's a commanding God. He's Lord of heaven and earth. He has a will, and he has a way for us to live our life. And why does he have a will and way? Because he loves you, and he wants the best for you. So when he's telling you to put down that ham sandwich, because he loves you. Not because he wants to deny you some great pleasure in this world. He wants, he wants you to be here in Shabbat rather than taking advantage of all the great deals out there or hanging out with family because he knows that there's no more important place you can be than when two or three are gathered together in his name on his day. The real message of Rabbi Shul's sermon is that the unknown God has made himself known. That's the irony of the whole thing. And we can know him today through faith in his son, Messiah Yeshua. There were three different responses to Rabbi Shul's message from Mars Hill. Some laugh. Every time you share your message of the good news of people, some will laugh at you. They'll think you're ignorant. Think you're simple-minded. And they don't take you very seriously anymore than they take God seriously. And you can expect that. You know, they get the consequence of their choice. Others were interested, but they wanted to learn more before making a decision. I'll dwell on that and I'll get back with you. And there was a small, very small group, a very small group, that accepted what Paul had declared, that believed in Hashem, and they surrendered their hearts and their lives to him. So many of us have stood up and accepted Yeshua in our hearts. But few have walked to the altar and put it all on the altar for him. Because they're still holding on to stuff. Values, beliefs, lifestyles, attitudes. We're still holding on to them. Those are the little gods in your life. Right. Those are the little gods in your life. The choices you make are often influenced not by God. They're influenced by gods. And you make your choices. You make your choices if you're going to bring your best to the altar in Shabbat. How many of you brought your best to the altar? If you can say, look God in the eyes and say, I brought my best today, God. I brought my best offering of praise. I brought my financial offering. I bought the best. I was I honored your word. I brought my best clothes. I brought my best attitude. I brought my best to you, Hashem, today to the altar. Can you say that? Or are you influenced by the little gods? In our world today, there are more little gods than there are people. I want to challenge you to answer this question for yourself. How will you respond? Will you just laugh it off? Or will you try to sort of work God's will into your will? Or will you be a small select for you that not only confess Yeshua, but live according to his will and way? If you do that, you might be on the road to perfection. 
because we are commanded to be perfect. To have that perfect spirit, that perfect attitude, that perfect maturity, that perfect responsibility. That's what he wants. I'm just quoting the scripture again. But it's there. We can either hop over it, or we can stop, take a look at it, and do a little personal reflection. What is your attitude? How will you respond to this holiday season? What is your gift to God? Please rise. Father, in Yeshua's name, I'm no different than everybody else here. I feel a, maybe a pressure, but a, a desire to bless those that I love and care for with the, the hopes and desires of their heart, a gift. I don't want to sin in the process of doing it. I certainly want to get in debt. I don't want to have to steal anything. But uh, Father, I hope and pray that I can bring something that will be a blessing to and yet, Father, I might have overlooked, Father, the most important gift that I can give, and that is myself to you this holiday season. To give you my time. To give you my time. To give you my talents. To give whatever I can give to you that will be a blessing to you. I, I have nothing more to give you, Father, but myself, my life. And so, Father, this holiday season, I will put on the altar, Father, and I'm going to give you my best. All that I have and all that I am. So, Father, when I, I'm thinking about gifts, Father, your gift is the first one I'm thinking about. And I pray, Father, that we all respond in the same way. What a powerful witness, Father, we could be. But that was our attitude. If we woke up every day with the edge of how can I bring my best? Not laugh it off or explain it away, but to say, no, I'm going to bring my best. I want to be perfect. I want to be that person that my creator and caring and commanded God desires me to be. I hope it happens this holiday season for all of us. But I know in the end, Father, you love us and care for us even regardless. But Father, I can say that about my wife and children too. They'll love me anyway, even though I don't give them anything. But I want to give them something. And I want to give you something today, and I hope we all do. We pray these things in the shoes of Congregation says, <laughs> Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord will lift his countenance upon you and grant you his peace, his shalom. But Shem Yeshua Adonai, we say these things and agree to these things in Yeshua's name. And the congregation says, Amen. Amen. Amen.